chapter one. It's all these different snapshots of Jesus at work. I begin at verse 21. Jesus has just called Simon, Andrew, James, and John from fishing. Verse 21. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. The unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her. She began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring town so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. A leper came to him, begging him and kneeling. He said to him, if you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose be made clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him. and He was made clean. Jesus in Capernaum. If Galilee looks like this, this kind of lake, then Capernaum is right up here in the top northwest corner. They've uncovered lots of archaeological houses in this region of Capernaum. They even think they found this house where obviously Simon lived with his wife, his mother-in-law, and his brother, because it's called Simon and Andrew's house. Simon and Andrew are brothers. Capernaum becomes for a while home base for Jesus. He is in Capernaum so much at this house of Simon's that in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 1, he calls it his town. This is Jesus' town, Capernaum, because he goes out from there and comes back. And one of the first things I notice in verse 21, after Jesus calls Simon, Andrew, James, and John, is that the he, being Jesus, he called them, becomes a they. They went to Capernaum. They went to Simon's house. The he is now a they. And I wonder sometimes if we so take this for granted that we lose the meaning of that. Jesus begins all alone. He's the only one that the dove comes upon when he's baptized and the Holy Spirit moves him out into the wilderness. He's still alone. He comes back filled with the Spirit, and after John is arrested, still alone, he comes proclaiming the good news. But then when he calls Simon, Andrew, James, and John, the he becomes a they. 
In order for Jesus to be alone now, he literally has to get up before dawn. He has to break away because the he is now a group. For nearly every aspect of living in this world, the I needs to become a we. The he or she needs to become a they. We need other people. We grow with other people. Even Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, gathers his disciples, and they will be with him now, right to the very end. The he becomes a they. And another very interesting thing here, when Jesus is called, the Holy Spirit drove him out into the wilderness, and there he deals with Satan. When Jesus calls Simon, Andrew, James, and John, they go to the synagogue when the Sabbath comes, but they still deal with Satan. Whether it's in the wilderness, Jesus alone, or whether it's they in the synagogue at Capernaum, there is the presence of evil there. There is the presence of an opposing force. I can only imagine the buzz when having entered the synagogue and the demon screaming out, Jesus rebukes and then casts the unclean spirit out of the person. Can you imagine this happening in a church service? It certainly would not be quiet. It sounds like there is yelling involved because Mark says he cried out, what have you to do with us? It's a cry, it's very upsetting. And some people read this and say, that's very upsetting that he brings the disciples right to the synagogue, first day of training, and immediately there are evil spirits there pushing against Jesus, crying out in his presence. But those of us who have been in churches for a long time know that every manner of sin is found not just outside the church, but also inside the church, right? We've dealt with everything imaginable inside a church. Stay in a church long enough, and every kind of brokenness will eventually be faced, including spirits like this, including people who are deeply distressed and caught up in evil. And you see this in Jesus' ministry. He goes into synagogues, and oftentimes, that's where a lot of the clash happens with evil. So notice also, when they enter this synagogue, it says, he taught. That's why that passage in Deuteronomy was read by Arthur. Moses reminded Israel way back when, before they entered the promised land, that a new prophet was going to come, someone who would speak the word of God, someone who would teach the word of God, and they were to pay heed to him above all else. Jesus is that prophet. He has finally come. And just in this little gospel of Mark, Jesus and teaching are together 30 times. He's teaching all the time. He's always teaching. He goes in a synagogue and teaches. He walks on water and teaches. He casts a demon out and teaches. He is always teaching people. He is the great prophet. And his teaching seems to be new. They're like, what is this new teaching? And his teaching is with authority. In other words, he knows what he's talking about. He understands what he's saying. He knows who he is. Perhaps one of the most disturbing things about this whole passage it is the part about the demons. People wonder about demons. And there have been many biblical scholars and many churches where the pastor teaches demons were for the first century when people didn't understand mental illness, when people didn't understand epilepsy, when people didn't understand sickness, they just blamed it on demons. So Jesus 
isn't really dealing with real demons. He's just making sick people well. But just in the Gospel of Mark, just reading it as an observer, you will see that he gets tempted by Satan in the wilderness. He goes to the synagogue and there's demons and there's more demons in chapter one. Then in chapter three, there is so much clash with Jesus and demons that the Pharisees say, Jesus has a demon. That's why he has this power. And Jesus reminds them a kingdom divided against itself can't stand. Then he goes across the lake and there's a man who is so bad and so oppressed and possessed by a demon. Then he goes on the Mount of Transfiguration, comes down and there's a demon possessed boy, then a Greek woman's daughter. Then Mark tells us Mary Magdalene had seven demons. Then as Jesus commissions the apostles, he tells them there to cast out demons. In other words, if you take demons out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you are taking huge sections of the Gospels out of the Bible. Seems to me that we need to believe what the Gospel writers are saying. First of all, because they talk about epileptics being healed, so it's not epilepsy. They talk about all manner of illness being healed, even in our passage. And he does not say that's demons. And demons are a separate category altogether. And they are throughout the Gospels. Admittedly, when Jesus started his ministry, the great light coming into the world, there were many, many clashes as compared to today. Kind of like if you're in an old abandoned building and you flick a light on and you hear scurrying and you know that the cockroaches and the mice have all just fled. When Jesus shows up, the light shines and you can almost hear all the scurrying going on amongst people who have lived in this condition for a long time, but now the light is right there and they cry out because of that light. There is a definite clash as you're reading the gospels that builds because Jesus is overcoming darkness, even this, what we would call weird kind of dark darkness. C.S. Lewis said that when it comes to things like the devil and demons, there's two positions to avoid. The first position is to say, there's no devil. That's the uneducated way to describe sicknesses. There's really no devil. When you do that, you've basically given Satan a carte blanche, the freedom to do whatever he wants because you no longer believe in him. The other extreme is to see a devil behind every rock, in every corner, under every little trial. That gives him too much power, and too much authority. When I was a very young Christian in my first few months, I went over a friend from work's house to talk to him and his family about the Lord. And the aunt came over who was also a Christian and we gathered around the table and prayed and in the middle of the prayer, this lady stopped the prayer, turned to her dog, and commanded the demon to come out of her dog in the name of Jesus, and then continued praying as if nothing had happened. And then when the prayer was over, I said, why did you do that? She said, the demon was in my dog because the dog was licking my hand when I was praying. Therefore, it was disturbing my prayer. Therefore, it was a demon. He said, do you really think demons are in dogs that lick your hand while you're praying? That's giving him a little too much omnipresence. I thought then, and I think even more now, that that's ridiculous. That's way on the other extreme. But to say that there is no demonic activity, that's an extreme we don't want to go to. It's obviously right there in scripture. And if we're walking in the light, we will face that. One of the reasons perhaps we don't face it that much is because we're not walking in the light enough. We're not recognizing it enough. But these people are very broken. When Jesus walks around here in the synagogue, then at the house of Simon, then later on with the leper, 
These are people who are so conflicted and broken that when Jesus comes near, they realize there's something about this teacher, this prophet, and they cry out that they need help. Just a couple more snapshots. Notice Jesus touching. You almost don't notice it, but when he goes into Simon and Andrew's house, Simon's mother-in-law is in bed with a fever. Fevers can be debilitating, as we know. And they, meaning Simon and Andrew, tell Jesus about her at once. As soon as they enter the house, she's sick in bed with a fever. Mark says he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And then a little later, as Jesus is moving from Capernaum, a leper comes to him and says, if you choose, you can make me clean. Jesus could have said, be clean. But instead, Mark says, stretched out his hand and touched him. The one thing you never did in Israel was touch a leper. In fact, you very rarely touched really sick people. And now that we're living through COVID, we know what that feels like. If we think someone has COVID, we're supposed to back off. We don't draw too close to them. But here is this prophet, this teacher, this spirit-led Messiah, and he is taking Simon's mother-in-law by the hand and lifting her up. He is reaching out and touching the leper. He touches all manner of unclean people throughout the Gospel of Mark. There was a pastor named Frederick Beekner who wrote a lot of memoirs and he wrote some fiction and he wrote a lot, a lot of nonfiction. But one of his favorite sayings was, go where your best prayers take you. Think about that sometime today or tomorrow. Go where your best prayers take you. And when Jesus is alone there and praying early in the morning, I have no doubt he was praying for all the needs he was about to meet. And when he's done praying, he goes where his prayers took him. His prayers took him to pray for the needy and lost, and that's where he goes. When we pray for the needy, for those who are financially hurting, for those who are sick, when we're done praying, we should go where our prayers took us and not just pray and cut and not just pray and say, we're done. We are often the answer to our prayers if we go where our prayers take us. And I think you see that in Jesus. His going and his praying and his going and his praying, they're all linked. His teaching and his ministry and his praying and his going, they're all linked. And you can see throughout this reading his authority. It's mentioned more than one time. People are awed by his authority, so much so that they crowd the house, so much so that verse 33 says, they're all at the door. The door is crowded with the city. It's so difficult for us to understand this. When Jesus began his ministry there in Capernaum, Within a matter of a week, nearly the whole town is gathered to hear him. Because they are all broken and they realize this one is not like a scribe. He will touch us. This one is not like a Pharisee. He does not separate himself from us. This one is one of us. And he has compassion and he has pity and he has love. That's how Jesus began to minister. His kingdom was invading and demons trembled. The book of James says the devil or demons believe in God and tremble. And we see that here. They tremble before Jesus. And he commands them not to speak because he doesn't want devils evangelizing. He will reveal who he is a year later to his apostles. It is not time yet, because when he reveals who he is, it will lead immediately to his death, and it is not yet time. 
But even the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17, when there was a demon-possessed woman following Paul and saying, he's a servant of the Most High God preaching the gospel, which is true, Paul gets annoyed and says, come out of her, you demon. Because he doesn't want a demon-possessed person evangelizing. We are the ones who are supposed to be evangelizing and praising God and saying the truth about our Lord Jesus. It is highly ironic that in Jesus' first visit to a synagogue, after his baptism, it is the demon who recognizes him and apparently no one else. That's very ironic. And it shows you how bad religion can get. That you can go through the motions, you can do the right things at the synagogue, you can be in the right place. A synagogue was a place of prayers and of reading the Bible and of teaching, no sacrifices. So they were doing good things. And yet, when Jesus shows up, it's the demon that knows who he is. And apparently, no one else does. Even though the Old Testament told them many times to be ready for the coming of Messiah. So all these snapshots in Mark chapter 1. Jesus, the I, becomes a we. The he becomes a they. Jesus' teaching throughout the Gospel of Mark. Jesus touching people, healing people. Jesus' authority over sickness, over demons, the presence of the spiritual world. Jesus commands. Jesus at prayer. And then where he goes, where his prayers have taken him. And then it will continue in chapter 2. Back in Capernaum. Back in the house. These are pictures of Jesus that are good to be reminded about, that we need to remember about him. And this morning, it is our privilege to remember Jesus in communion. So all of you who are listening, I'll give you a few moments to gather bread, cracker, juice, wine, so that we may take communion together. Or perhaps you're already all prepared. We all good? If you're not, you can just unmute and say, hold on. A prepared people. So I came across a true story this week that reminded me of this passage in Mark but even more reminded me of why we take communion. It's the tragic story of that ferry that went down where 300 lives were lost at sea. It was overloaded, they didn't close the doors right. But in one story it talks about as the ship was beginning to take water and chaos prevailed. There were 400 something people on this ship. That one man suddenly jumped out and he did not work for the boat and he was not the captain who's in prison now for negligence. This one man jumped up and took authority and started telling people how to get the safety boats out, how to put on their safety vests, where they should go, moving them through the ship. All the people that ended up living, a hundred some people, credited this man with saving their lives, for taking the authority. He stood up on things, guiding them as to where to go. And then he went down into the hold to see who was left there. And at one point, people saw him holding one end of a ladder and the other hand holding 
the hold that was beginning to sink. People were climbing out of the hold, holding on to his arms, following his body up to the deck, which was listing badly and getting on the safety boats. When the whole thing was over, they found his body. He had died. He had taken authority, guided these people to safety, and then lost his life in the endeavor. That is a very small picture of what Jesus did for us, who came, as you can see from Mark chapter one, into a very dark world full of broken people and took authority and spoke with authority and spoke truth and shined his light. And there was intense pressure against him and he kept moving and he kept praying and he kept training his disciples. And at one point, he started to tell them this task would require his death, that he would need to give his life up. And so he did. So that we could be saved, he gave his life for us. God raised him from the dead putting his seal of approval upon what he had done. And that death and resurrection is what we remember every time we take the bread and the cup. Just as those 100 some people, I'm sure still remember that man who took authority and gave his life for them. In an even deeper way, we remember Jesus who was on the boat with us, who suffered with us, who took our sins and our sicknesses, and then who gave his life for us, and who still is with us so that we can be like he was, so that the I can become a we in this world following him. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread of that Passover, and he broke it and said, this is my body which is delivered up for you. Take and eat. Do this in memory of me. Take and eat the body of our Lord Jesus delivered up for us. And when it came to the cup of the Passover, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. This morning in our homes and across this nation and across the world, there are people taking little cups, big cups, one cup, tiny ones, grape juice, wine, and drinking in memory of Jesus that he gave his life for us. So take and drink and remember how he gave his life so we would be forgiven. Father, we thank you for the blessed Jesus. His ministry amongst us is amazing. Thank you for the gospel writers. Thank you for these snapshots, which amaze even us, just reading about them. We pray your blessing upon our day, that we would walk with you, that we would go where our best prayers take us. <laughs>